Hello, everyone. My name is Anu Nadin, Product Marketing Manager at It's Learning, and I want to warmly welcome you to this free webinar, Lessons from COVID-19, Five Key Strategies to Prepare for the New School Year. The COVID-19 pandemic made digital learning a critical resource for educators all over the world. But with lockdown slowly easing, the question now is how prepared are schools for the uncertainties ahead after the summer holidays? What contingency plans, multi-tiered or hybrid approaches, do they need to consider? This is what our presenter and moderator, Rachel Riggio, will try and answer today. Rachel, she's our customer success manager and was an educator for more than 20 years before joining It's Learning, the leading learning platform provider in Europe. Joining her today is Brani Kuma, coordinator of instructional technology at Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation in Indiana. She's put together a checklist and preparation protocols for the year ahead to share with us. Some housekeeping before I hand over to Rachel. We will have a question and answer session at the end of this webinar. To ask a question, please use the question field in the control panel, which should appear on the top right of your screen. You can type in your questions anytime during the webinar. With that, let's get started. Rachel? Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. It's uh, good to have everybody here on um, on board. Uh, our presentation for today um, hopes to give you some key strategies and some considerations as you're thinking through, um, thinking about uh, what we're going to look like going back uh, to school in the fall. So, this webinar is for you if you are currently planning for transitioning to the new school year. Uh, if you would like to know strategies to put in place for transitioning to the new school year, no matter what it might look like. I know a lot of us aren't truly sure what that will look like yet. And also, if you would like to hear how districts have successfully met students' needs during the COVID-19 pandemic and how they plan to move forward. So by the end of this webinar, you should have a set of strategies to plan for and transition to the new school year and be able to create an action plan for that transition. And hopefully you've heard um, some stories that resonate with you from a, a district in Indiana um, who successfully met the educational and social emotional needs of students during the pandemic and who have a solid um, plan moving forward. So what does back to school look like for us? Uh, it could be face-to-face -face learning where students return to the brick and mortar classrooms with some differences in, uh, in place. Uh, we know already from some of the government guidelines that have come out from the CDC and the Academy of Pediatrics that there will be some spacing and social distancing considerations to think through and that, um, that's a huge component for many districts who have um, who have lots of um, overcrowding perhaps or lots of large classes. Um, so we have to think about that spacing and that social distancing. Um, there's also the uh, possibilities of adjustments in um, waiting areas and eating areas, large group areas, even gyms and things like that. Um, and then of course, transportation changes. Um, what does that busing look like? Um, again, some of our districts that we work have have overcrowded busing. So what does it look like to um, have a safe and healthy way of transporting students to school, as well as those that are picked up by parents and um, dropped uh, and dropped off by parents? So definitely a lot of things to think about um, with regard to um, face-to-face -face learning. So then we might start with online or remote learning again, quite the same as we did this spring. So that remote learning would continue. We have to think through all of those same points we thought through back in the spring, technology access, uh, Wi-Fi and data plans, um, technology support for any challenges, challenges that arise. Uh, and something that really came up, um, really thinking through training teachers 
to conduct robust and engaging online learning. I think that was one of the biggest concerns that came out of the districts that we worked with and the teachers and admins that we worked with is that teachers that were very prepared and very skilled in the brick and mortar classroom felt some trepidation about going completely online and how that changed what they would do um, with their students. So I know that has had a huge impact on what training will look like this summer. And then of course, curriculum. What does our curriculum look like? There needs to be adjustments made to that curriculum in light of what has occurred, um, what occurred in the spring and having to go completely remote. Again, what we, how we deliver in the uh, brick and mortar classroom doesn't always resonate when you push it online. So there's definitely some differences in curriculum and how we deliver that curriculum. And then, of course, there's that hybrid model that may happen. We may have some phased reopenings. We might have reduced hours or some of the schools here where I am in Georgia are thinking about staggered scheduling, something that may look like a group of students coming for a morning session. They leave in a group of students coming for an afternoon session or perhaps off and on days. A group comes one day, they stay home the next day. So lots of different um, potential models that will include some technology component to support that. And then, of course, there are the possibilities of intermittent closures um, due to um, a resurfacing of the virus, uh, what have you. And those would be similar in um, scope to like a, uh, you know, snow days or an extended um, weather day sort of situation. But there's always that possibility. So there's a lot of things to think about here and to think through. So we've um, divided them into five key considerations, strategies, if you will, buckets, if you will. Um, one of them being the student considerations. That's number one. Number two, we have those environmental considerations. Number three, still um, at the forefront, technology access and support. Um, number four, curriculum. And, an inst and instruction. And then five, of course, so important is our communication to stakeholders. So let's take a look and think through number one just a bit. We need to consider all students' needs upon the return. And there's some key points to think about as we welcome students back. There's of course going to be some lost instructional time and a real need for continuing social and emotional development. So while everybody works very hard through the spring to continue to deliver quality education for students, there is some, there are going to be some gaps that we need to address. How are we going to address those gaps? What sort of needs assessments are we going to do? And then what recovery or remediation processes will be put in place to get students back to where they need to be. And then that social emotional development piece is going to be so important when they come back because it's certainly the pandemic has created a lot of different layers of stress for students and their families as well as teachers and admins. Um, the next piece is nutrition. We all know that many students get, you know, a, a good part of their nutrition from when they're at school. So we need to think through how are we still going to continue to provide those sorts of meals to students because we may have to think through um, smaller groups in cafeterias, eating in classrooms. So perhaps there's more grab and go sorts of selections of food for breakfasts and lunch. So definitely thinking through that piece in this um, new structure we may see. Addressing all of our special populations and students students with disabilities in the way that they need to be addressed is another um, something in the forefront, as well as health requirements and health services when we're at school. Should someone test positive for the virus, you know, how are we going to handle any isolation measures or contact tracing measures there? So there's always those um, health issues that we need to think through. Athletics is another uh, major issue to think through as that's such a huge part of a student's social and emotional development is being able to participate in athletics and extracurricular activities. So how do we bring those sports teams back, those clubs, those cheerleading squads back to where they can practice and get ready for the games and we can also watch the games. Um, and then finally, and, and 
not of least importance is our mental health. It's so important for everyone um, as they've gone through this pandemic and experienced uh, the different layers of stress or frustration or um, anything that comes along with that. We need to be at the ready to address those when students and teachers and admins get back to school with our counselors and our social workers. So lots of things to consider as we begin to develop plans for students to come back. Well, number two, environmental concerns. So there's quite a bit of guidance and, and documents that have come out for some, from some government organizations um, that have hinted at these environmental concerns that we have. So, you know, should we have um, the virus come back again and, and folks begin to get sick again, what are the isolation measures? How are we going to handle that piece? How are we going to handle the large group sizes that we're so used to? Um, in secondary school, classes are fairly large. We bring large groups together in the cafeteria or in the gym or the media center. So how do we have to think through what size groups we have? How can we ensure there's social distancing and spacing and people are kept safe. There's also some discussion about movement within the school day, which again affects the uh, secondary folks quite a bit as students are switching classes. So is there a way that we can keep students um, from some of the movement that they typically do, do um, during a school day? And then um, disinfecting and sanitizing procedures. There's been lots of information about how to clean, when to clean, how often to clean, um, to keep all of the areas in the school building um, disinfected and sanitized so we're in the cleanest, safest environment possible. Um, and then, of course, those large group gathering spaces. How are we going to deal with the cafeteria? Again, are we going to pull small groups in? Um, are we not going to use the cafeteria at all? Are we going to eat in the classrooms? Um, the gym is the same. So what are we doing with those large group gathering spaces? And then transportation. So how do we keep uh, the transportation flowing, get students to and from school, but do it in a safe manner where we can maintain distance, where we can keep it clean. Um, so lots of environmental concerns to think about as we develop our plans for going back to school. Number three, which was a huge component as we began this journey of the pandemic uh, in the spring in trying to maintain those learning environments for, for students. So it, it will be present again as we go back. Um, even if we go back to a brick and mortar situation, we know most likely we will have a technology component that will support that return to school. So the same questions come to mind. Uh, access to technology to support teaching and learning for students and teachers, access to Wi-Fi, to data plans to be able to get to those materials, and support for those technology issues, which we will always know will come up, and those challenges around um, the use of technology and keeping it up and ready and stable. So lots of things to think about still with technology, no matter what plan uh, we decide to go back with. And then number four, we need to think through the curriculum and instruction that's being considered for all possible plans, for all possible scenarios. Um, we know that there's going to be some sort of technology component, so digital curriculum will be in place, and we want to make sure that curriculum is designed with the student in mind. Um, we want to make sure there are engaging and robust online learning or blended learning experiences for students. I think there were quite a few lessons learned over the spring about what sort of experience students need to have um, online or in a blended environment. And I think one of the main things that came out of this, and I believe Brenny will speak quite eloquently about this, is the authentic and meaningful assessment piece. Perhaps we can't always, we can't do what we've always done with assessments in a remote or blended um, environment. That those assessments need to be very authentic, engaging, and meaningful to kids. And then our last point is those well-trained teachers that feel comfortable and equipped to instruct either remotely or in some sort of a blended um, experience. And then finally, the communication piece is so important that whatever plans we do develop, whether it's plan A, plan B, plan C, and we're not sure which one we're going with, that these are developed and detailed 
and communicated to all stakeholders. Um, again, even if there's multiple plans that we're planning for any event eventuality, that we know what we're doing and we have you and your students in mind and then making sure that we get that out to everybody who needs to know about it. So everybody feels comfortable that we do have a plan in place to go back to school in the fall. So we talked about this a bit when we talked in the spring that is of vital importance to create a solid team to create these plans and to help execute these plans. So at that central authority or that district level, you'll see on the left-hand side that there should be a technology representative and that's sort of the hardware folks, the nuts and bolts to make sure the technology is up and running, as well as the instructional technology rep that's going to handle how we use that technology in classrooms to deliver quality learning experiences. Of course, a curriculum and instruction representative that can speak to what the, the curriculum is that needs to be delivered and how we can deliver that best to students. And then a student support representative so we ensure that all students are um, attended to here, that we know we've got special ed students, we've got those gifted students, we have our ELL students, so everybody is attended to. And then the student uh, information system representative is very important because there will still be those questions, especially if we have staggered schedules and whatnot, what does attendance look like? Um, so that's super important um, for the team. And then finally, that PR or communications representative that's going to be able to package this message and deliver it to the community. And then at the school level, you see you have your principal or assistant principal or headmaster and assistant headmaster, um, someone who is involved with data and attendance should be a part of your team, counselor or counselors, um, any of the department heads, the grade level chairs, and certainly a media specialist who is well equipped to help teachers design engaging experiences for student, students. So the, these teams that convene are the ones that can really speak to all of the different facets of a plan that needs to be created. All right, so let's think about actions that need to be taken centrally by the school and even by these different roles that are in place. So when we think about central and school, so at that district level or that central authority level, the team needs to be convened, the plans need to be developed, and that documentation explaining all phases of the plan. So if I come at um, the new school year with a plan A contingency, a plan B, a plan C, all of that should be very detailed and we've hit every piece of the plan and who's responsible for executing it. And that we ensure all stakeholders know what's coming. Um, and, and how to handle that. And then any training that needs to take place, and this is already um, being talked about with quite a few of our districts, what does the training look like? Training is gonna look different this summer, this further PD that teachers are taking, admins are taking. And then at the school level, again, the team using the, document, uh, the documentation from the central authority or modifying it for your building, and then ensuring all of your stakeholders are um, aware of whatever plan is coming and that you know that your staff has been trained in handling all of these situations that are going to come up in the fall. So let's look at our kind of four categories by role here. When we think about administrators at the district administrators or the school administrators really, that their role is to ensure that there's clear communication to the staff to the students and to the parents on the details of our opening plans and how things are gonna roll out. Also to support teachers and students in whatever plan takes place, supporting teachers to instruct students to learn. And then if we think about our IT's learning admins, those folks that are handling the technology pieces, that they should be really working with us as project managers and customer success teams to ensure that we have everything in place that we need to support you in the, in, in, in the journey that's ahead in the fall. And then when we think and look at tech teachers and lecturers, we want to make sure that those teachers can um, that those teachers can create lessons that are based on expectations for whatever the return plan, whether it's remote for a bit or whether we do come back to the brick and mortar and maybe we spend a couple of days in school, but a couple of days in asynchronous learning, that they feel really good and really equipped to be able to teach um, in that sort of, sort of atmosphere. 
And then we want to make sure that they use any of the technology technology that's available to support these plans. We want them to be comfortable with the technology and that they still support the student's social and emotional well-being as we know how important that is. And then our student's role is to use the technology where appropriate to assist them as well in what they're doing, that they complete their work on time and in a satisfactory manner, and that they keep the lines of communication open with teachers when any issues arise. And then of course, for our guardians, our parents, our mentors to support the students, as well as the teachers with any plan that's laid out. Um, and to monitor, monitor the student work that's happening and to again communicate with teachers or lecturers as need, um, as need be. So if we think through some of the districts that I've already been talking with, um, some examples of what they're doing in response to what occurred in the spring, um, what will be happening this summer and into um, the year 2021 as we start the 2020-2021 school year. So um, in discussing this with some of our districts, uh, many have decided to flip all summer PD to a virtual experience to, a large, to avoid large group gatherings. Um, and that's really pretty much across the board. That's what districts have already, uh, that's the model they've kind of already gone to. Also retooling training to ensure teachers are ready for a blended or a completely remote opening if necessary. So definitely a lesson learned from the spring was that possibly, you know, those tactics that work so well in a brick and mortar environment don't necessarily work as well in an online environment. And how, how can we equip teachers to be comfortable in that environment? And emphasizing training for new administrators so they can support their, their teachers and students in what's going to occur in the fall. Um, lots of district conducting stakeholders, stakeholder survey, surveys in response to what happened in the spring. What worked? What didn't work? What needs improvement? And, and what are your thoughts for going forward? So um, lots of districts gathering those um, pieces of information now from all stakeholders. That includes students, teachers, parents, um, ad administrators, community members, just to, to make sure we're addressing all of the needs there. Uh, many districts have allowed students to keep devices over the summer, including their personal Wi-Fi, should there be a remote start. So then we don't have to go back to trying to get um, devices to students. And then these creations of these distance learning plans. Many have already started to put these plans in place and write this information down. And they really consist of these strategies and instructional components that support a sense of community, as we know that's very important in a remote world, the content delivery, any differentiation or personalization that's necessary, how we interact with the content, and how we monitor progress. So all of that is coming together in these distance learning plans. Um, also, districts are going to summer professional learning series that center around engaging the learner. Uh, we have found, um, you know, in our journey into remote learning this spring, how important it really is to engage students and how different that is to engage students online than it is if they're in front of you in a classroom. And then many are conducting their new teacher trainings in new teacher virtual academies. So lots of plans happening already, lots of creative ideas about how to get this next year up and running. So before we hand it over to Brenny to hear the good work that's been happening in Bartholomew, I just want to indicate to you that there are um, some links to resources here, uh, some documentation and guidance from some government organizations, as well as a report from EdWeek and our very own website to help guide you as you begin to make these plans and think through how the fall will look for uh, your district. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to Brenny now so she can show us all the fantastic things happening in Bartholomew. Thank you, Rachel. All right, everyone. Sorry, making this so you can see me and then also see my closed captions. All right, so thank you, Rachel, for that warm welcome. Um, as Rachel said earlier, I am from Columbus, Indiana. My name is Brenny Coomer and I am the coordinator of instructional technology, and I work for Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation. Now we are a little bit unique for a typical Southern South Central 
Indiana school districts. We have about 83,000 people who live in our county and our district serves our county. We have 11,500 students and we're unique in that we are a manufacturing hub. We have Cummins Engine Company that's based in our area, Toyota, um, Orsia, some big manufacturing companies that are based there. So we have quite a bit of diversity in our area that's unique from some of the surrounding school districts in our region of the state. We have 19 schools, we have career and technical education programs, adult education, pre-K. Uh, we have 60 different languages that are spoken in our district. And um, we have about 13% of our students who qualify for special education services and about 45% of our student body qualify for free and reduced lunch. So that's just giving you some context on our district before I dive into some of the things that we've learned from this experience and planning ahead. So I think a lot of us throughout this whole experience, I had a colleague mention this morning that we kind of were learning as we were going and doing the best that we could to plan ahead and prepare. Um, and I think that's the best way of looking at anything moving forward is that we've been through this learning experience and now we have at least that experience to guide us forward. We have a little bit better of an idea on what things worked and what things didn't. So for us, as we move ahead in BCSC and think about what learning looks like in the future, and we don't have a official plan yet, the big focus is really having our teachers think of their its learning courses as an extension of their physical classroom learning environment. So we use universal design for learning as our instructional framework in our school district. It guides our decisions from what paper materials we put in our students' hands to the technology that's mounted on the wall to what programs and software we use. So we really have been using that as our guidance for years now, but helping our teachers see that your online learning environment, your its learning courses and the way you design your classes also make up that physical classroom too. And it needs to be providing options that needs to be accessible. So these are key questions that we've really had our teachers think of from day one and emphasizing them even more now as we go into summer and offer training. What options do we provide our students to get them excited and motivated? So giving them lesson goals. Um, do they understand that goal? Is it framed in learner-centered language? So students understand it and their parents understand it. Um, how, how can students learn the information? What options are there? Are there options that don't require a lot of bandwidth for some of our students who might have internet variability? Um, what options do we provide them to show their understanding? And really focusing on no tech, low tech, and high tech options, because while we have, um, we're very fortunate in that we're one-to-one -one in our school district, we do have quite a bit of internet variability. We have some rural areas in our district where students, there's not even internet providers that really service those areas. So we had to be pr pretty creative with giving those students um, internet access, but also having our teachers plan for that up front and think, what are some options I can give my students that they can do without a computer if need be? So after going through this last quarter of the school year entirely remote and um, using that experience to guide some of our lesson design moving forward, there's there's a lot that we've learned. Um, I could probably talk for hours about it, but. I'm trying to condense it here to some of the big things that we've learned and we're going to use moving forward. Um, so engagement, focusing on engagement in our lesson design. So making sure that we focus on the learning goal first, not the tech. There are a lot of companies out there who provided access to paid tools for free during this experience, and that's great. And a lot of our teachers started using them um, and we're excited to do that. And we're bringing those tools and resources into its learning. And we're even using its learning tools that maybe they hadn't used before, but quickly realized that if we're using technology for its own sake, and it's not necessarily something that is really linked to our learning goal or content goal, that that can create some problems. Um, so our teachers really had to kind of learn that the hard way a couple of times and realize that if I put a new tool in there, I need to make sure that I demonstrate to students how to use it and that I get their feedback so I know what worked and what didn't. So focusing on that goal and if the technology aligns with that. 
Um, we've also realized that it's really important to set some basic must have standard lesson requirements in your lesson design. So making sure that every single day, parent or a student logs into its learning and goes to their course, that they see the lesson goal, and that's one of the first things that they see, along with the instructions in a instructional video that basically explains what students are going to be doing that day and then demonstrates via a screencast or something along those lines any new tools or resources the students need to use in that lesson. Um, and that's something that's kind of come out of this is a hindsight. We loosely shared that expectation with teachers before, but now we're having conversations to make sure that's something that all of our administrators, our curriculum directors set as a firm expectation moving forward. We've also learned that it's really important to have that personal human experience when you're teaching remotely. And I'm sure everyone can agree with this, that school is a very social environment. We, we treasure those moments we have with our students and those quick conversations with colleagues in the hallway in between classes and even those meetings after school. And it's very different when you're teaching remotely. So it's important that you still try to put in those personal elements, those opportunities for um, social interaction and for students to see your face. So the example here is that this teacher was wonderful and that she always had some type of video element, even if it was a short video, so her students would see her and know that she was still there. That, that goes a long way. And I think that's something that our teachers really noted early on and continued to do and will continue to do in the future. Um, importance of social interaction, as I kind of said, I got a little ahead of myself, but being able to interact with each other is very important as well. Um, so building in those opportunities, whether it's a whole class Google Meet or um, a Zoom call, even if it's just for a few minutes, that goes a long way to have students talk with each other. And that's something that you can do even if you're in a blended learning environment where some of your students are at home, some of them are in your physical classroom, whatever learning model you go into next year, that's something that you could do. So everyone's still a part of that whole family classroom experience. Um, flexible deadlines, I think, are something that we really stressed and our teachers realized in this experience are so important. We have some students who, we're ready to go at 5 a.m. and we'll log onto the platform and we're already starting on their lessons. We had other students who, because of you know, maybe the circumstances and their parents' work schedules at home, they couldn't get online until late into the evening. So giving, giving our students flexible deadlines and um, giving them grace and when they can turn in assignments was important. And I think that's something that will transcend into the model that we use in the future is that everything in this past quarter of school, the past nine weeks, was so unknown that being flexible made sense. We had to be flexible because everything was constantly changing. So I think that's something that we'll continue to emphasize moving forward. And then equity of access. We are one-to-one, -one, so every student had to, has a device provided to them from the school district in grades one through 12, but that was not the case for kindergartens. That's, that's a really big learning experience for us is realizing that we need to create more equity for our kindergarten students so that they have a device that they can use to access lessons. So that's something that we are working on and I'm sure other districts have as well. We've started organizing um, some research and conversations with kindergarten teachers and their families and figuring out how we can improve that. Looking at our future lesson design as well, um, making sure that we provide instructional videos regularly. One of the tools that our staff use quite often and for free was Screencastify during this time. So we're looking to purchase that and it's really easy to add Screencastify videos into its learning. Um, and that's something that our teachers have begged for after this because they demoed tools and showed students where to go in the course and how to add a picture or how to add an audio file to an its learning assignment. And said students really loved having that support. So that's something that we want to continue. And I think that'll be important no matter what model you go into for learning in the fall, that you continue to provide those short instructional videos because that's helpful to a student, even if they're in your physical classroom, for them to see and have that option to have that self-help resource to figure out what they need to do or to have that as a reference. Um, 
as well as having those videos, the teacher here, she always had videos of herself and her lesson showing students um, basically just reading that day and going through the goal and the lesson um, flow and sequence. And I think that's something as well that our teachers are going to continue and try to do and something that we are going to encourage them to do is to provide those short little videos whenever you can, because that, again, it's just another self-help resource for students and they can kind of be empowered by having that resource there on their own. Um, and then asynchronous options too. Even if we move into a model where some of our students who their parents want them to stay home instead of going to school, and they're going to, they're going to use remote learning and remote teaching, it's really important that you have those anytime, anywhere options so that students can learn on the schedule that's best for them um, so they don't feel hindered. So again, that kind of goes back to the flexible options and flexible deadlines, but asynchronous is something I'm sure my district is probably tired of me saying, but it's very important to have so that students can have accessible options. And it also helps address some of that internet variability that exists as well. It was also important during this experience that our teachers realized the, the need for authentic assessments. So part of that, I think a relief for a lot of our teachers was that standardized testing was taken away. We didn't have to do any standardized tests during this time. So they didn't feel like that was something that they had to prepare for necessarily. They didn't have to pause their lessons and do days of testing and then go back to um, traditional lessons. So I think that helped our teachers realize that we weren't moving towards that specific test. We could really focus and slow things down and give students flexible um, assignment options. So I also think that through this, um, worthwhile authentic assessments became something that our teachers realized were really important because if a student wasn't logging in and doing the assignment that was kind of a red flag why wasn't the student doing the assignment maybe because it wasn't engaging an online worksheet is not the most exciting thing in the world so it our teachers really kind of cut out some of those busy assignments those busy work pieces that you might have in a traditional classroom setting and focused on enriching activities where students could share their voice beyond even just their it's learning course an example i have on here is that there was a teacher in one of our high schools who all of the students contributed to a class time capsule which was phenomenal and they're going to open that um, later on and every kid had choice in how they could participate some students wrote out information in it's learning other students made a slide and made videos and had audio recordings. And that's just, that's a powerful way to have students meet those learning objectives, but in a way that is meaningful and reflective for them during this time. We had other teachers and students that did blogs to kind of work through their emotions and what they've been thinking during this pandemic. Um, other students made podcasts. And I think that this, this is kind of a great thing that came out of this experience is that our teachers started to think about how they could use technology in creative ways, using its learning and even bringing tools into its learning that maybe they didn't have the time for before. But because of this environment, it was important to have those different creative assignments to keep students excited about learning. And then quality over quantity. Again, um, our teachers realized that it's not necessarily about completing 45 minutes worth of work online, if that's what your typical classroom Last time is it's important that you make sure they reach that learning goal. And if that learning goal is less than 45 minutes, then that's okay. It's not about filling time, it's about the quality of the lesson and the content the students turn in. So looking at how we have been training and kind of tweaking our professional development model moving forward, we want to make sure our staff have options. So we have an online professional development course that teachers can always access. But we also want to make sure they had other ways to still learn this summer because a lot of them are wanting to learn new tools and plan ahead, even if the ahead is unknown and what it looks like. So we, uh, like Rachel mentioned, a lot of our usual in-person conferences are now being flipped to where they are virtual. So we have a summer UDL Institute that all of our staff can attend. And now that's going to be online via Zoom. But we also are providing some other PD opportunities. And I think this is something that will probably continue in the future because that's the great thing about blended PD is it's more accessible to staff 
as well. So we're doing weekly technology trainings. My uh, colleague and I are going to be offering those and the tools we're going to be focusing on are ones that teachers mentioned they want more training on. So it's, it's learning tools, it's Google tools, and we're offering those one time each week or multiple weeks during the summer where they can come in, drop in for a few minutes, get some new tools, practice using them, and ask any questions, but we're recording those so they can access them any other time. Um, like I said, we have our It's Learning professional development course that I'll have updated with just some tips and pointers. Um, we have a blog that we started as well that has educational technology tips that really focused on teaching during a pandemic remotely, but also just have some tips moving ahead. And then we also are going to continue a podcast study that we had last summer. So additional summer planning, because everything is so unknown, moving ahead and planning is something that can help us kind of reach some of those roadblocks as they come up, is that we've definitely been using feedback to guide our decision making, whether it's information from our teachers, our technology department, our administrators, and our parents and our students. We've been using that quite a bit, and it's really guided some of our decisions. So purchasing Screencastify for our staff, um, establishing must-haves for their courses. So as our teachers start to design and think about lessons in their it's learning courses for the fall, they do that this summer, that they have some of those elements in place already. So a key thing for us, and I kind of mentioned this already, is that we're focusing on how to streamline and simplify navigation because a lot of our parents would contact our um, virtual learning support phone line and say, I don't know where to go in this course. Or I have a student in fifth grade and a student who's a freshman and I'm trying to help them, but it doesn't look the same across those different grade levels. So for us, it's thinking, what are some basic things that we can ask teachers to put in their courses so that it at least has a little bit more consistency so our parents and our students feel more comfortable and that they can be more goal directed because they understand where they're supposed to go. Um, and then also making sure that as we put content online that it's easy for students to go back and see past lessons for that asynchronous component so that they know what maybe if they're a day behind or they're trying to catch up they can easily get to the content from that previous day. Other summer planning that we're doing is really encouraging our teachers to proactively plan lessons now, um, whether that's making instructional videos in advance, no matter what model we go into in the fall, um, I think it's important to have a video component online in your course before even that school bell rings if you're in a physical classroom so that students have that self-help resource and have that option and can see whether they're in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Um, so adding those elements to your courses before the lesson starts. Regularly including options as well. Um, we're putting some examples in the It's Learning Library so teachers can easily copy those into their courses, but I, I'm really encouraging some of my rock star teachers who really thrived in this virtual learning environment to share their resources, share their sample activities and ways they use its learning tools and technologies in the library so that we can all benefit from that. We had some teachers who had some creative ways of giving students a way to help each other as well. Um, so something that we're going to share with our staff is to put in some self-help resources for students. One of those being using the discussion tool on its learning and setting it up so that students can post questions there and other students can answer them. There was a high school teacher who did that and um, she knew that sometimes she couldn't answer a student's question as quickly as maybe another student could. She said a lot of her students were in there just kind of catching up but also helping each other and reminding them of deadlines if they forgot or answering assignment questions when she wasn't up all hours of the night like they were uh, asking for help. And then leveraging the It's Learning messaging tool, that's something that was pivotal during this because it's so important to have a social interaction and the ability to stay in touch with your students. Our teachers and our staff are going to continue using that. And um, even during the summer, a lot of them have been sending out resources to students, even though the school year for us is ended. I think that's something that we need to remind our teachers that that feature is there, whether you're doing remote teaching or not. And it's something you can always 
lean on to stay in touch with students when they're in your classroom and outside of it. And I'm almost through here, but a couple other things that we're doing in terms of planning ahead. Our students did keep their devices this summer. We have a mix of Chromebooks and then laptops at the high school. They were keeping those. So they still have access um, to their device, but they also still have access to its learning as well. A lot of our school counselors and some of our family services counselors and support and social workers have its learning accounts, and that's a way for them to stay in touch with students and still provide that social emotional support. Something else that we've learned from this experience and that we're, that we're working on as well is guides that are directed towards students. We made so many PD resources and trainings and tutorials that were geared towards our staff on this is how you use this tool and this is how you can set up your course and simplify navigation and send out a mass message to students on its learning. But as, as the weeks rolled on, it became very evident that we needed to have more documentation and help guides for students, help the students and even maybe their parents who are helping the students. So we have worked on those, we made some of them during this time, um, but I do feel like that was a little too late on our part. But now that we have this experience behind us, we can kind of think ahead and make those resources now so that students have all those tools and their toolkit to help them moving ahead. We're going to share those in the It's Learning Library so our teachers can easily pull those into their courses and we're putting them in multiple languages so that all of our families can use those um, as they need to. So that's, that's pretty much the gist of what we're doing to plan ahead. We definitely don't have all the answers, but using our past experience as a learning experience um, and not something that's going to hinder us, I think has been helpful. Um, getting the right people in the room, like Rachel mentioned, is really important. It's important to have lots of different perspectives as you plan ahead. And for us, it's it's thinking how how can we continue to do what's best for kids? So as we go into this unknown and we don't have a set plan yet, um, it's a sea of possibilities and it's a sea of learning in using technology in creative ways. Um, and we're thankful we have its learning to do that. And hopefully you have some ideas and resources that can help you and you can share them with us so we can all learn and grow together. Uh, the question that I have here is how overall, how well have your students adapted in your view during this lockdown? Yep, I think uh, our students adapted really well. Um, as time went on, I'd say so, but it was definitely a unique learning experience. We had some students who thrived and I think really enjoyed the virtual learning experience. We had others who maybe struggled, but I think what was key was that our teachers and our school counselors really reached out and identified the students who were struggling early on so we could figure out what, what worked best for them. Um, and something specific that I heard many families and even teachers saying that was helpful was creating checklists for students. So they knew what assignments to complete on what days and just having that resource really eased some of those nerves. So I can, um, I, I can chime in as a parent of a student <laughs> um, during this uh, pandemic. My daughter is a ninth grader. Um, so she did, you know, a, a good bit of her freshman year online. Um, and what I think was really nice is the teachers were very consistent. Um, she does use its learning, so they made uh, great use of the planner um, and were very consistent and very detailed in what was expected of the students with um, the context of the lesson as well as the any resources and activities associated. So I think that made it, you know, much easier for the students to access and get their work done. And, and Brenny, it's interesting, you mentioned checklists because um, her teachers did, um, you know, include checklists and she then included her own little check off. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. So kept them very organized. So, um, you know, she kind of got very used to it and did, um, you know, very well. She actually flourished in that atmosphere. So it was great. And the second question that I have here is, um, how well have your teachers adapted? What kind of or level of support the teachers of your school get, especially those in the higher risk groups? I think what Rachel said earlier about teachers being a little nervous at the beginning, that was definitely true. I mean, I was nervous and <laughs> this is really my world is this environment, it's learning. 
designing lessons online. Um, but I think what was helpful for us is that we did do a lot of training and preparation up front. Virtual learning, e-learning specifically is what our state refers to it as, is something that we've done before. So we had virtual learning days about three years ago um, due to inclement weather, we had flooding and lots of storms. Given that was not the same environment as what this pandemic was and e-learning for us in the past is only for a couple days, not months in a row. But I think that helped some um, in that we had some training and we had some resources out there, just some tips for setting up a course online and resources to use within its learning. Um, but I definitely think that ongoing professional development during teaching remotely in the pandemic was important. We didn't want to overwhelm our teachers. So we sent out a weekly email that had key things based on what we were seeing through our call center, which is where we had a lot of the communication with parents. So we'd share key updates to teachers on this is what we're seeing. Here's some tips. If you see this question come up, we gave a couple of um, tech tips. Every time I sent out one of those emails, I had an it's learning tip and then a tech tool that was outside of its learning tip. Um, and those, those tips came with resources, videos, lesson ideas, and a guide. So they had some options and how they could use that information. And then every, every Friday during e-learning, well, not every, but most Fridays, we had in its learning recap where um, our director of technology and myself would touch base with administrators and instructional coaches in the buildings to give them some tips and pointers and then to hear from them. I think that was helpful because they were also in the more on the ground in the building support and it was helpful for them to get ideas from us but also to share ideas so that they could provide one-on-one -on -one support to teachers. So I think options was important for us as a long-winded answer. Rachel, you want to add to that? Um. You know, I think that uh, working with districts uh, across the country and, and working with teachers in training and support, I think there were so many teachers that I heard from that were very nervous, you know, as Brenny indicated in her districts, about going to this remote learning. But with support, both from their district and from us, it was really interesting to see some teachers really flourish and do some incredibly creative and um, really authentic learning experiences for students. So I, I think in a way the, the pandemic kind of opened eyes to what um, could be done and was possibly not being done. So I think overall it was a, a great learning experience with some early trepidation, but I think people um, really caught on and did some great things for kids. Um, yeah, and we've got one comment here that says one advantage is that learners are now also taking more responsibility for their learning process. And that's something we've definitely seen mm -hmm. across Absolutely. all of our customer base. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if there's a prolonged closure and school in fall begins electronically, how do you think teachers will be able to build critical relationships with students? Something that usually happens at the start of the school year and through face-to-face -face engagement. There's definitely a possibility um, <laughs> point. <laughs> I'll start off by saying that. And it's, it's a little crazy to think about that because as a former teacher, I taught middle school and those first nine weeks, it's just really getting to know the kids. So thankfully there are ways to do that still. So I think, I think what would be important for teachers to do is to really focus more on the social interactions, not necessarily completing certain assignments online and a task list. In that sense, it's more focusing on how can I give students ways to connect. So it's those video calls, it's discussions, it's um, even assignments that students can get to know each other. So maybe everyone's working on a slideshow together and each kid makes a slideshow or a slide about themselves. And the, the assignment is to really kind of look at that and learn about each other. So I think there are ways, but the most important thing is putting your face out there and videos and finding ways to connect. Yeah, and I think back to when I was um, a teacher in the classroom, you know, those first those first few weeks, right, are so crucial in building those relationships. And I 
remember some of the old school stuff that I even did where I reached out to families on the phone, you know, and called them and spoke to the students, spoke with the, the parents. And I can imagine something along those lines, but perhaps with uh, FaceTime or Zoom or Teams where you're um, interacting with the family, you know, getting to see faces and, you know, body language and talking to those students and be able to really, you know, create some of that rapport um, together as well as in, you know, other discussion forums and things like that. But certainly that seeing each other um, on a video call would be would be so important in a situation like that. Right. Let's take one more question. Do you think it will be an expectation from here on out that some students will want to stay at home and learn? I was just having this conversation with some colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. Um, I think I think yes. I think that's definitely the case. I think some students, like Rachel and I both said, have really thrived in this environment and may notice that they prefer online learning. So I think that's a possibility and I think that's an interesting thing that's come out of this experience is that because students have had an alternative way to learn, they've kind of gotten some, uh, they've had some opportunities for um, metacognition and focusing on how I learn and what works best for me and maybe that is something that I want to continue to do is have the opportunity to learn remotely. So I think schools can provide that option, whether it's by allowing students to be in some type of virtual program or it's teachers making sure that no matter what you do in class in a physical lesson, that there's a digital component that is an option that goes along with that, that could help kind of meet those, those students' needs and still give students that virtual environment feel if that's something that they prefer. And yeah, interestingly enough, some of the districts that I've seen um, their plans for going forward, you know, they're in the midst of writing these plans. And there's actually a component in a lot of these plans for just that, those parents that decide it's, you know, it's better for them and their family to keep their students at home and learning, or there's some that have a safety or health concern or what have you, that they're actually building that into the plan. How do we handle that situation because that's really kind of a whole different component of the of the uh, teaching and learning um, you know atmosphere is that I've chosen to stay home and do this how do we address that so it's an interesting component that's come out of all this that districts are actually putting into their plans okay uh, we're coming to the end of this webinar so I want to say thank you Rachel and Brenny for your excellent presentation and for taking the questions, lots definitely for us to take away as we prepare for the reopening of schools after summer. And thank you for joining us today. You can always find information on our upcoming webinars on the It's Learning Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn sites. And if you'd like to know more about It's Learning, just go to the contact us form on our website and we'll be in touch. This rounds off the global It's Learning webinar series for spring. We will return with a new series of educational webinars after the summer break. I hope you all stay safe and have a great summer, everyone.